All right. Welcome to everyone who just joined. Thanks. Thanks for hopping on. We're just giving it a couple more minutes here um, to let some more people trickle in before we get going. Okay. While we kind of wait here, I'm curious, Elizabeth and, and Sydney, do you guys have any other bucket list hikes or places you think um, people would be interested in, in learning more about? In like Utah, that area, or just anywhere? U.S. Um, hmm. Good question. I'm... Do you do you have guys have Whitney? Because I've never managed to get the lottery for that. I've also never been able to do Whitney, but it looks so beautiful. It's always a lottery issue. Um, have you guys done any of the other parks in Utah? Have you I've been to all of them except Capitol Reef. Okay. Um, I kind of skipped that one in the middle, but I don't. I'm not super sure sure why. I don't know if it was just like a timing thing, and I just kind of. Yeah. That was me up until this year where we knocked off the middle one, but. Did you like it? Did you feel like it was worth the stop? I think you need to go with a four by four. So I want to go back. We had my, we had an SUV, but it was, it was all wheel drive. Mm -hmm. And after talking to the Rangers, they said, you need a true four by four. So we decided okay. to nick like half of the stuff we had planned just cause we're like, it's not worth getting stuck out there. So we'll go back with a four by four someday. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you have a four by four, 100%, if you don't have a four by four, it's like there's, you're really limited because most of the park is four by four. That's a really good tip. I know I can testify, testify it. the one time I've been out to Washington, I was visiting <laughs> pretty, um, and I tried to go explore Mount Rainier on my own and go to like the lookout hike. Um, and I was driving up and there was still snow on the road and I got stuck no. and I was stranded on this four service road for like eight hours with no oh. service and like <laughs> only a couple of other hikers. And it was just like one of the, it was just a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so go prepared with the proper vehicle is, yeah. is the lesson learned. <laughs> it's true. Um, okay, awesome. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, and then I will do my best to stop the screen share and make sure that I, I'm letting everyone in as we, as we go along here. Um, great. Let me just... All right, are you guys able to see that? Yep. Awesome, great. Thank you everyone for, for joining this evening. Um, we're gonna be talking about planning a trip to Zion and Bryce Canyon National Parks in, um, in Utah. And we have two wonderful guest speakers with us tonight who were just in those areas. Um, so they're gonna be lending their expertise. Um, great, so this is just sort of the quick agenda. Uh, we're gonna give some intros. We're gonna talk about how to get there, when to go, and then dive into each park with different highlights and tips. And then we're gonna end with a Q&A, but this is a really conversational evening. So if you guys have any questions throughout, ping them in the chat um, and we will make sure to answer them. Oop. Hang on, I skipped a slide. Perfect. Okay, so first a little bit about Adventure Tripper. For anyone who's not familiar with us, um, we are an adventure travel company um, and we sort of specialize in personalized, affordable and inclusive adventures. So our mission is really simple and that's to help more people go on more adventures. Um, and as a part of that, every month we host these sort of informational webinars about different destinations um, across sort of the US and the world just to sort of provide a little bit of, of educational content. Um, so I'm going to now hand it over to our two speakers to let themselves do like a quick little intro. Um, so Elizabeth, let's hand it off to you. 
Hi, I am Elizabeth. I am a teacher. I consider myself early retired. Um, I quit this past year and am working on my blog and interior design and I just love hiking and backpacking, kayaking, pretty much anything outdoors. Um, and I love sharing the things I learned, the gear, tips, and anything else that I can provide other people. I like to share that along the way. Awesome. Great. Let's go ahead to you, Sunny. Oh, hey. Hi, everyone. My name is Sunny Shailendra. I'm not from Seattle. I'm from the Bay Area. And I have not been into any outdoor sports or adventures. Uh, I just started very recently. So I... I work as a cancer research scientist and I really enjoy outdoor and nature. And I realized having good health is so vital and, you know, being outdoors is so important. It's so important for just holistic healing and everything in, in general, it's just so holistic to be out, to be fit. And so I am a huge fan of outdoors and I started hiking, have done a couple of great hikes and would love to share anything about it. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Okay, great. So the first thing that we're going to tackle um, is how to get there. Um, so the closest major city to Zion um, is Las Vegas. And so that's a really popular destination for people to fly into. One of the other options is Salt Lake City, which is a little bit further, but it allows you to hit all of the national parks on your way down if you want to do a longer trip within Utah. Um, but I'd love to turn it over to Elizabeth, obviously coming from Oregon. Um, did you fly? Did you drive? What was your method? Um, both times that I've been down there, we have driven. Um, I think it's 16 hours from Oregon to drive down there. And we just like having our vehicle, not having to deal with rentals and we're always camping. So for us being able to just take all our gear in our car is the best option versus flying and then trying to bring our gear, um, on the flight. If we weren't camping, flying would definitely be a good option because then you could just stay somewhere you wouldn't have as much to pack, but because we camp everywhere we go, we always drive. That makes sense. What's the typical stopping point for you on that 16 hour drive? Um, it depends when we leave. I mean, anytime we've gone to Utah, our goal is to get to like Twin Falls, Idaho or Boise, Idaho, spend the night, we usually just sleep in the car and then drive down. If we leave early in the morning to Utah, we'll go all the way to Salt Lake, take like a break, get gas, um, and then keep driving the rest mm -hmm. of the way. So it just depends on if you are able to drive really long distances. My husband does all the driving. So I'm like, let's go. If I was driving, I don't know, I might need a little more of a break, but. Yeah. All right. And then Cindy, what was, what was your method? Did you drive from the Bay Area or did you fly in somewhere? I've done both. So it depends on what you want to do. So the last weekend, we just wanted to get um, Zion Narrows and Angels Landing out and we didn't have much vacation time. So we thought, okay, let's not waste time driving. And it was like three, four women that went and we were like, okay, we don't want to drive. There are no men to drive. <laughs> so we just thought, okay, let's fly. But the parks that I did was not overnight camping or the hikes that I did was not overnight. So it was doable. Uh, we flew to Vegas, rented a car and drove for two and a half hours into Zion. The other time what I've done is I've flown to Utah, Salt Lake City, and drove for the other parks in, in Utah. But we've also done a road trip from here to Vegas, Vegas to Zion, that too we've done, and all the way to Horseshoe Bend. Uh, so it yes. depends. On, yeah. So it really <laughs> depends on how much time you have and what you want to do. If it's a backpacking trip, definitely driving is better. Yeah. Did you find Horseshoe Bend is worth the stop? Because you'll notice I put it here on the map. Um, mm -hmm. It's like another two hours from Zion and kind of two hours from Bryce. So it's not the closest there, but yeah. it also feels like close enough that if you're in the area, it might be worth going to see if you have an extra day. Do you, what do you know? Did you feel like it was Yeah, worth absolutely. It? Yeah. So I went in the winter, so it was beautiful. Plus we combined Antelope Canyon with it. Right. So when and you those combine who don't know, that's a really cool slot canyon. Cool slot, yeah. So when you combine the Antelope Canyon and the Horseshoe Bend, I think it's worth it. Horseshoe Bend in itself, I'm not sure, although it's it's cool to see, definitely. Yeah. I don't think I would do it if I was just doing Horseshoe Bend. Right. It's a pretty long drive, and there's no hiking. You basically drive in, you walk half a mile to the viewpoint, um, and you have to pay for it. So you're driving like two hours to pay to go overlook the Grand Canyon, which you could go to the National Park for. 
Mm -hmm. um, but if you're doing other things like a Lake Powell trip or like Antelope Canyon, something like that, then it would be worth it to combine something. Awesome. That was great advice. Awesome. So let's jump into when to visit. Um, I have some couple of notes on the screen here, but we can kind of um, ignore those for the most being. Um, so I know you guys both recently went. And so I'd love to hear about your experiences in the summer um, with sort of how did you feel like the temperatures were? Um, and then did you feel like the crowds were, were manageable? Or would you recommend going in the off season like fall where it's a little bit cooler and maybe less crowds, but um, potentially if you go too late snow? I've been to both in May and in June, and it was mind blowing the difference between the two months. Mm -hmm. um, I would 100% avoid summer if you have that option. Obviously, if you're going with kids, you're limited, like you need to go in summer. Um, but if you don't have kids or you're not taking your kids, I would avoid summer at all costs. Mm -hmm. After this last experience, it was very crowded. The trails were very crowded. The shuttle was very crowded. Parking lots were crowded. And when we went in May, it was, crowded i mean it's a national park there are always going to be crowds but it was very doable i never felt like people were encroaching on me or had to fight to get a spot somewhere and i definitely felt that in the summer months fair what about you Cindy? how was your experience yeah similar um i've been there in the winter and just last week so that's end of august august mid-august right so mm -hmm. there are still a lot of kids there but there is always fun around having so many people in a national park versus winter looks more gloomy, things are kind of closed. So the advantage is you have so many restaurants, you have so many, everything is open in the summer. That is one big ad advantage if you're not used to being alone in a national park. It just gives you the feel of you're somewhere like really popular. Um, but early morning, so we took the first shuttle for all the hikes. So 6 a.m. is the first shuttle. So the first having an early start helps both from a flash flood standpoint and from thunderstorm standpoint. Perfect. So that, that was a great avoid the crowd. Then you yeah. avoid the crowd, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great transition because for those who may not know, Zion for Zion National Park, um, there's a, a shuttle system, and to get to the majority of things in the park, you have to take the shuttle, and you the road is closed to to private vehicles, um, and so the shuttle is. $2 a day, so it's inexpensive. Um, however, it can get, get crowded. Um, so obviously trying to get to the first one, uh, the first shuttle is a great tip if you're willing to sort of um, wake up early. How else did you guys find the shuttle? Um, how long did you feel like you had to wait for it? Um, was it an issue? So it's, it's very, it's there every four minutes from 6 a.m. Every four minutes you have a shuttle. So there's not much of waiting. But if you want to get the first shuttle to avoid the crowd, you need to reach there by 5.30 a.m. for a 6 a.m. shuttle. But then you're in a line with other people and you just keep talking. It's, it's okay. It's okay for that because you want to get the hike done and complete the hike versus not having to turn back because of weather situation. Mm -hmm. What about what you, Elizabeth? How did you okay. find it? My shuttle experience was polar opposite of that. When I went, I don't know if there was an issue with the shuttle, but we waited almost two full hours to get on the shuttle and we arrived wow. at the park at about 5 15. Wow. So it was all oh, really oh my <laughs> like, god when was it which month was that? So I mean in the June. line literally did not move all morning. Oh, oh, and we we're okay. actually getting frustrated. We actually were considering just like walking down mm -hmm. and like finding another way to get there because it's taking so long. Um, and we're the type of people that like we're first on the trail. We're always there early. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't the issue. We were there early and the shuttles weren't working, but I think it was just that day. I'm oh, hoping the other people had been there the day before and they said it wasn't an issue. So maybe something was wrong with the shuttles that day. Mm -hmm. The first time I went to Zion, it was an off month. It was May. It wasn't full summer. So we got on pretty quickly. The shuttles moved pretty quickly. Um, but there was a long line, even in the summer. So like this, well, I guess not even in the summer, the morning line, but there's still a line in the afternoon and stuff for the shuttle. It just moved quickly. Yeah, yeah. I think there is another option actually to say, stay in the Zion Lodge. If you can get a come, like you can just walk to the Angel's Landing or Narrows is a bit far, but Angel's Landing, you can just walk to the trailhead. Yeah. yeah, that's a really yeah. good point. So that's stop number five, Zion Lodge. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that's the only accommodation in the park, I think. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So it 
books up fast, but if you're able to plan well ahead um, and you manage to get accommodations there, that's super helpful and will make your, your time easier. I think sort of the key, the key takeaway is just understanding that Zion is an incredible place to experience, but there will be lots of other people there experiencing it as well. And so I think the key to the shuttle system is really sort of managing your expectations um, and sort of just plan accordingly for your day have a plan B <laughs> if things go, if like things are going awry or like any, any of that sort of um, thing. Would you guys sort of agree with that? Yeah. Awesome. Great. And then um, I put a couple of key stops here. We're going to get into best, the best things to do, best hikes, all of that. But when we send this deck out later, you guys will kind of have um, a quick hit cheat sheet of what stops lead to what sort of adventures in the park. Um, okay, great. So these are some of the best hikes in Zion. Um, and you know, in, in our opinion, there's lots to do. <laughs> um, we're not going to talk about all of them in depth. Um, we don't really quite have time for that this evening, but what we are going to talk about in depth are two of them and that's the narrows and that's angels landing. Um, and those are sort of the two most popular, um, sort of trails. We're going to talk about the narrow and sort of the upcoming slides, but here I would really love to chat um, Angel's Landing with you guys. What was your experience? Did you find it as incredible as it looks? Um, when did you hit the trail? What were the crowds like? Um, were you nervous holding on to the chains? Um, let's uh, let's have Cindy, you go first and tell us about yeah. your experience. Sure, yeah. So we went, um, we drove from, from Vegas to um, Zion and then we unpacked our bags and we said let's go to Angel's Landing without realizing that it's already afternoon so we reached the trailhead we got the shuttle on time we reached the trailhead by 2 p.m and we got to the trailhead and then we are like as soon as we reached we could go because the sun sunset is only by eight but the ranger said no there's thunderstorm I don't advise it so we came <laughs> we came back and next day we were supposed to do the narrow so we did the narrows the third day, we went back early morning at 6 a.m., got the first shuttle and did Angel's Landing. So it's very weather dependent mm -hmm. and uh, there is thunderstorm, lightning. So afternoons are, uh, you know, absolutely not possible, I would say, to do, to do Angel's Landing. It's better to plan it first thing in the morning. More chances of you and taking the first shuttle is because you don't want the crowd trying to come down when you're trying to go up. Mm -hmm. So just to avoid the traffic, it makes sense to be on the trail as the first person or the on the first shuttle. Yeah. Um, so it, it wasn't, it is scary, of course it is scary, but then it's uh, doable, totally doable and so fun. It's like an exhilarating feeling just being there. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great to hear as someone who's a little bit newer to, to outdoor adventures, how you how you found it and were you know able to go ahead with it because it is kind of a little bit more of a high exposure hike, which can make you nervous if if you have a height thing. Um, awesome. Elizabeth, how how was yours? When did you go? What was it like? Um, both times that I've done Angel's Landing, I was at the trailhead first thing in the morning, mostly to avoid the heat. That hike is very exposed and it's hot in Zion, like 90s to 100 plus degrees. Even in May, I think it was like high 80s, almost 90s. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to be on and off. And one thing to realize is you're touching chains. So if it's really mm -hmm. hot out, your hands are going to have a hard time holding onto those chains. Um, and if you're not comfortable, you're going to be wanting to hold the chains the whole time. Yeah. Um, and there's spots where you have no option, like you need to hold them. So for us, first thing in the morning was really important just to avoid the heat and the crowds. And then for me, I don't find anything really uncomfortable about the hike, but I have seen people full on panic attacking up there when they're on the cables crying, um, people asking why they ever even thought about doing it. So you get a big mix of people and you just have to know, like, what are your, your boundaries? What's your turnaround point? and be okay with that, I think. Um, so for me, it was like cruise on through. I did it with my mom this last time and she was a little more hesitant. So like I would offer her my hand when she felt uncomfortable, just help pull her up. Mm -hmm. um, and she did fine, she was great, but she was a little more just cautious than I was. Like I can cruise through and feel fine. And she just was like, I'm gonna take my step carefully. I'm gonna hold the cables carefully. Um, so it really just depends on your comfort level, but it is, 
hundreds of feet drop-offs on both sides. So you have to know going in, like, that's what I'm going up against. Um, and I think it's really important. A lot of people, I don't think go in realizing that you're on the, you're on an edge of a cliff on both sides. Um, and did yeah, you find so, that, oh, go ahead, Cindy. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to add, um, I, my, you know, fingers, my hands sweat a lot when I'm hiking. So I took the, you know, the weightlifting gloves or some gloves that had some grip on it. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me with the cables and not slipping off and taking hiking poles is absolutely no, no. It's better to be on all fours. It's just easier that way. Um, so no hiking poles is, would be the recommendation. Yeah. That's great. And did you guys feel um, comfortable with if there was someone ahead of you and you had a faster pace or so forth or people passing you, did you feel like it was comfortable enough or like did going early enough in the morning kind of avoid any of like that nervousness? The first time I went, we had no real issues moving around people. There just wasn't that many people on the trail that like you could easily kind of maneuver. Like there's areas where it is one person at a time. So one person would come down, then you would go up. When I went this last time in June, it was so crowded that I, it felt like herding sheep because no one was willing to like take charge. So at one point I was leading a group of 20 to 30 people down and I would yell out down the trail, Hey, stop. You guys need to wait because people would just come and come and come. And then it's just so crowded that no one can move and you're just bottlenecked. Yep. Um, and so after realizing that was going to happen, if I didn't step up and say something, um, I just started telling people when to stop. I told our group when it was safe to move. Um, and that's the downside of the crowds is you really have to navigate and communicate and you're going to get people that don't want to be kind and courteous on the trail, which is really unfortunate. Um, like people are getting really frustrated, um, that they had to wait to go on the cables, but it's not safe. Like you have to take your turn and you just have to be patient. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. so if you're going to go in the summer months, just know that it's probably going to take you a while and you're going to have to be really patient with other people moving at all different paces, trying to get through there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think, again, the key to Zion is maybe um, incredible, but be patient. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of maybe like yep. the, I just, the for the park. I just took yeah. that time. I just took that time to take pictures. Yeah. yeah. We were waiting it. We were waiting anyway, so <laughs> for people to pass through. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a great way to do it. Um, they're, they're potentially putting in a permit system. And if that goes through for 2022, that's going to drastically change what summer looks like most likely. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so this was probably the last summer where it's really bad because I, I'm sure it'll pass. I don't understand why it wouldn't. I've been saying it for years that it needs to happen. Um, so I think if they put that permit system in, it'll be a lot less crowded up there and easier to get through that section. Great. Yeah, I will say for anyone, for anyone in the audience, if Angel's Landing is sort of a bucket list hike for you, um, now might be the time to go do it. Um, before there is a permit system in place, which would make it more difficult. And like, if you don't get a chance, um, like if you're in the ladder and you, and you don't get it, um, and fall is a great, great time to visit Zion. So it's like this, this fall um, or this spring might be, might be your best chance. Um, and then I just wanna call it a couple of things. If Angel's Landing is a little, a little too intense for you, um, some of these other ones on the screen, Emerald Pools, Watchman Trail, um, Canyon Overlook are all really great sort of beginner family friendly hikes um, that you can still get great views uh, of the canyon. So one trail I will say really fast that I always encourage people to do is Observation yeah. Point it is almost identical to Angel's Landing in terms of the view. You're actually looking down at Angel's Landing from this hike, but there's no crowds, there's no cables to go through, and you can do a six mile if you go to the east side of the park and come in, it's a, like a six mile drive or six mile hike in. Okay, of, that's great. So the eight mile is actually currently closed right now due to damage a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it'll open soon, but yeah. I would definitely do that one if you're nervous about the cables at the top. Absolutely. Observation point is really good. Yeah, I agree awesome. too. Awesome. That's a great tip. Um, awesome. Um, we're going to move on to the Narrows, um, which for those who may not know, it's walking through a river on, in Zion, and it's a really cool experience. Um, the first two miles are sort of a paved um, path called the the Riverside Walk, um, and that's just a fun experience, kind of in and of itself, before you enter the water. And then from there, it's about two and a half miles up to what's called um, Big Spring Junction, and that's often a turnaround point for a lot of people. But you can go, I think it's like another two miles up the river um, as well. And kind of the further you go, the more people you lose. Um, 
So that's if you're like in it and you're comfortable with the water, um, I would say try to venture out to Big Spring because um, you'll get to have a little bit more of it to yourself. Um, but it's a really, really fun and unique experience. Um, and so I would love to kind of hear from you guys. Um, what did you wear? Um, did you have a walking stick? Did you get, did you rent the neon neoprene booty socks? Um, what did you feel like you needed to have like a successful day in the Narrows? Okay, I'll go. So um, this was my first time doing Narrows or just being there. So I had no idea what to do. I just read the reviews um, or I even spoke to a friend who said that, you know, you can rent everything. You can rent the boots and the stick. So the boots, the socks and the stick, it comes together as a package while, when you rent them. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, like initially, oh, with COVID, should, do you want me to rent the neoprene socks? It just felt weird, but then, um, I thought, okay, we don't have any choice. I don't want to buy the shoes just for this one hike. So I went there and the renting is so easy. It's so easy. Like at 7 a.m. or something, the, it opens and you just go there and you just enter on an iPad. You rent, you get this kit and the shoe fits perfectly and the neoprene socks fit perfectly. It's very comfortable. Those shoes are pretty broken into, so they're very comfortable. I was a little iffy about, will I be comfortable? Will my ankle be? It's, it comes up to the ankle, so it's pretty comfortable. And as far as clothes, I just wore like a regular um, tights that is a little bit water resistant. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. The backpack was a regular backpack that we usually have like a summit pack, a small backpack, but we put a plastic bag in it and all our stuff in it just to prevent in case if we get in, go in more than the waist down, it doesn't get wet. Great. And then how far up the Narrows did you go, Sunny? We went all the way, all the, I did the 10 mile, the entire 10 miles. Oh, wow. Not, yes, oh my gosh. All the way. Okay. Yeah. So what was, what was that like doing the whole thing? How long did it take you? How many people did you see 10 miles up? Yeah, 10 miles out, we didn't see anyone. <laughs> we were yeah. just the only people. I was like, where are all the crowds in our shuttle? It was so packed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we were just waiting to see people because it worried us, is there a flash flood coming? Because, you know, mm -hmm. suddenly we don't see any people. So we reached the end, we saw few few people. And as we come back, we see more and more. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, some people want to, kids to experience the Narrows. So they do the initial one mile or so just for the kids to have fun. Even babies on strollers or like yeah. they, they do the Yeah, they do tiny, tiny babies. They come with tiny babies to just to be do this fun hike. Mm -hmm. So you yeah, know, if you want to cool experience it, heroes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you want to just experience it, just go. And people were wearing, you know, regular water shoes, like not the, the sandal kind. Mm -hmm. But I would highly suggest getting the boots. I just felt more comfortable because the surface is very uneven. And then you keep slipping a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Elizabeth, how about, how about you? Um, what did you have on your feet? How far did you go? So we went in, we probably did six miles total when we did it. Well, I mean like six miles in the water, like yeah. around. Mm -hmm. um, and when we did it, I actually just wore my Jockos because I hadn't really researched like, I, I mean, it was so long ago that I wasn't researching to the extent that I am for stuff now. Mm -hmm. and I had no issues with my Chacos. I would not recommend Chacos just because your toes exposed. Yeah, I would but say if you're going to do a water shoe, try a Keen probably. Yeah, I would do something with a closed toe shoe, which is funny because at the time I did have closed toed water shoes. I just didn't have them on that trip with me. Um, but we did not rent and I felt totally fine in my Chacos minus my toes being out, but I didn't have any issues and the water didn't feel cold to me. And I am the biggest baby. To, like I don't get an Alpine Lakes. Like I don't put my feet in the ocean half the time. And I felt fine, but it also probably just depends on when you go, what the weather is, you know, miles up river, what you're getting coming down. Um, mm -hmm. so I think you could probably do it either way. If you don't want to spend the money, you could get away with regular water shoes. But if you are worried about your feet getting cold and you know you're going to be in the water for a long time, I would maybe spend the money and rent. Yeah, that's definitely for, for everyone kind of um, listening in. The biggest thing to know about the Narrows is that you should always, always check conditions. Um, so at the visitor center every morning, and you can also look it up online, um, it's going to tell you what the flow rate is um, and then like what the weather conditions are. So flash flooding is an issue. So if a rainstorm is coming in, because obviously you're in this narrow canyon, it can fill up really quickly. Um, and so you just have to be really aware sort of of 
what the conditions are going to be like and make sure that you go on on a clear day. Um, again, start early in the morning so you have enough time. Um, again, weather gets trickier in the afternoon, so that's um, kind of the kind of the way to go about it. Um, and then most people go in the summer because of water temperatures. But if you're up to rent a wetsuit or dry suit, you can always tackle it um, in the fall as well. Awesome. Um, so uh, let's move on to Bryce Canyon. Um, so Elizabeth is going to be chatting a, a little bit more um, on this one because she was recently here. Um, so here's a quick map of, of, of Bryce. Um, and Bryce Canyon is really known for sort of the, these really unique rock formations that are called hoodoos um, that are super unique um, and really kind of just like the iconic, iconic Bryce um, landscape, which we'll get to some photos in a minute. Um, Elizabeth, are you still able to hear us? Cool. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. Um, awesome. Okay. So what I'm hoping to ask you um, about Bryce here is, so there's a, there's kind of this main road and there's a lot of different viewpoints. Um, you have inspiration point, Sunset Point, Sunrise Point, Rainbow Point, Fairyland, um, all of sort of the ones. And so did you feel like one viewpoint was better than the other? Did you see all of them? What was sort of your method for kind of stopping at those? Um, so I've stopped at every single one. Mm -hmm. um, both times I've been to Bryce, we actually got there in the evening mm -hmm. and we drove the whole way down to Bryce Point so we could look the whole park and then worked our way back down to see all the other viewpoints. Mm -hmm. My favorite viewpoint would either be sunrise or sunset point, just because you're right in with the hoodoos. Um, and you can walk on the rim without having any railings if you want. Mm -hmm. Bryce point, I mean, you kind of walk out and it's beautiful. I mean, they're all beautiful. You can't really go wrong with any of, of mm -hmm. them. Um, and they're very quick to get to. You literally just walk right to them from the parking lot. So it's not like you have to walk a long ways. Mm -hmm. um, but Bryce Point is beautiful because you can like see the park the whole way down like it's a long view. Um, I just prefer Sunset and Sunrise Point I think because I feel like you're a little closer to the hoodoos really versus looking wow. down at them. Totally. And then did you, did you walk the rim trail at all? Um, for, so for those who might be curious, um, so all along Bryce, um, there is something called the Rim Trail, which essentially connects all of these points. Um, so walking the sunrise to sunset is really popular, and that's like two miles, I believe. Um, so yeah, have you have you walked any of it, Elizabeth? Do you feel yeah. like you would recommend so, that that's a good trail? One of the hikes that I did was the Fairyland Loop, and in order to do the Fairyland Loop Trail, you actually walk the Rim Trail. So we walked the rim trail from Sunrise Point up until you drop down into the Bryce Canyon area. Mm -hmm. um, and then you hike back up near Sunrise Point as well. And I love walking the rim trail. I mean, being down in the hoodoos is its own experience that you can't miss. I mean, that's what you're there for is to be with the hoodoos and stand among them. Um, but being able to look down is really beautiful. And I think if you go sunrise and head north along the rim trail mm -hmm. to do the fairyland loop, you don't have to do the loop, but just walking that section, yeah. um, it's really beautiful because it has a lot of pine trees. Mm. Um, and it's just this really interesting vibe that it gives you of like the pine trees with the red rock. And I, that was actually one of my favorite parts of the park was having that mix of the two landscapes. Awesome. That's a really great call out. Um, cool. So we're just going to kind of move on here. These are a couple of images to kind of give, give a little bit of life to what we were talking about. So this is inspiration point here, which is one of the viewpoints um, that we were just mentioning. Um, Natural bridge is another sort of viewpoint along the main road that's really cool to check out. Um, and then for those who want sort of like a, a nice, like um, very sort of like chilled, a little bit different desert oasis within Bryce, the Mossy Cave Trail is pretty cool. Um, but we're gonna get on to like the most iconic one <laughs> in a second, um, but you can see, we're going to talk about it in a second, but as a part of the Navajo loop, you have this really cool sort of like staircase down into it. Um, and then here is Thor's hammer, which is probably the most iconic of all the hoodoos, I would say within Bryce, um, probably one of the most photographed. Um, so we're going to obviously talk about the Navajo loop and queen of the gardens trail in a second, Elizabeth, but is there anything else that you feel like within Bryce, um, 
to call out that's sort of like a highlight? I think for me, my absolute favorite thing is doing the Navajo loop first thing in the morning because there's way less people. And this last time we got there early enough that, so the, if you see the Navajo loop, those switchbacks are called Wall Street. Um, and we had Wall Street to ourselves, which is pretty rare. Incredible. Just beautiful. When you have that place to yourself and you're standing amongst those walls, it's pretty breathtaking. That's great. Um, cool. And that's the perfect segue. So kind of like, I feel like the hike within Bryce Canyon to get down among the hoodoos, the hoodoos is there's kind of two. So you have the Navajo Loop and Queen of the Gardens trails, which if we go back up to our map, um, you can see Queen of the Gardens here and then Navajo Loop. So you could do them separately or you can connect them together into one loop. Um, so, um, and there's these really cool archways that are sort of that you can like walk through. You have Thor's hammers there, Wall Street, which Elizabeth just mentioned. Um, and so a lot of people um, some um, recommend starting at Queens Garden at the sunrise viewpoint um, because it makes for an easier descent on your knees, but it means you have a steeper descent up Wall Street. So that's kind of the two things to keep in mind. You can either go down Wall Street um, and then go up a more gentle ascent or you can have a gentle descent and kind of a steeper, steeper way back up. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to kind of like dive in here a little bit about, um, I don't know, sort of like your experience on these, on these trails? Um, yeah. I mean, like I said, my favorite is to start at wall street. You're going against the majority of the people. So mm -hmm. you get that opportunity to have wall street by yourself if you get there early enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me, I like to do the Navajo loop straight into Queens versus doing them separate. Um, mm -hmm. just because you can easily walk down to Thor's hammer from like the main viewpoint. So once you finish the loop, if you want to go to Thor's hammer, you just walk down and you, I mean, you can see it from the rim, yeah. um, but if you want to walk down, do it to see it close up, you can just walk down without doing the whole first loop. And then I like to do it as the two together because you can go into Queens garden really easily as well. And then you can also do the two bridges from there without ever doing the full loop separate. You can just combine them and just kind of walk up a little ways to see them all. Awesome. Cool. And then sort of in your opinion, um, cause Bryce, I would say, I guess I don't actually know from like a square mileage <laughs> perspective, um, but Bryce is, seems smaller than Zion. Um, <laughs> uh, definitely. Right. And so, um, do you, how many like days would you recommend? Do you feel like you can do Bryce in a day or do you feel like you want two days? Um, what's your opinion? gone we've done one full day and then like an evening and for us that's always been more than enough mm -hmm. um, just because it depends on your hiking pace it depends how many hikes you're actually wanting to do but you could definitely do one to two full days and get a good feel for it if you're not someone that wants to do multiple hikes in a day you definitely want to stretch it out mm -hmm. um, but the first time I went we did we got there and we did the Navajo and the Queens loop together in one evening and then the next day we did the longer fairyland loop and we feel like I mean after a while the hoodoos start to kind of Look. feel the same I and mean, they're beautiful yeah. but there's only so many things you can walk through but we're like okay I know what this park is about yeah um, how so. did you feel because the fairyland loop um is a great I've hiked that one as well um it's less popular which is great um and it is I don't know how to quite describe it but it is kind of a different way to experience the hoodoos than than queen's yeah. gardens it's kind of a different i don't know how would you sort of describe yeah. the experience um well like i said you have a lot of like the pine trees and you aren't even in the hoodoos in the beginning so you walk the rim the way we went you walk along the rim and you overlook the hoodoos and then you end up in like a forested area completely away from the hoodoos so it gives you a different feel because a lot of the park is actually forest area you just aren't in the hoodoos mm -hmm. hiking um, so it gives you a feel for the forested area with the pine trees and then you drop down and the hoodoos are much more spread out on the fairyland. I feel like like you're there's a lot of like dirt trails but in this picture you can see it's like hoodoo after hoodoo and the fairyland trail doesn't really get to that until more of the end I feel like. Yeah. Um, so it is a very different feel than the fairyland loop or than the um, Navajo. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. So that was kind of, that was kind of us covering, um, Zion, Zion and Bryce. Um, 
before we like move on to any questions or anything like that, um, um, do you guys feel like Elizabeth and Cindy, do you have anything to add that you feel like people should know about these parks? Any tips, any advice, anything you feel like we haven't covered yet? Um, I think it's really important to pack a lot of water. Um, there's no water spots to fill your water anywhere, like on the trails and it's the desert. So you can get dehydrated really easily. And I think it's important to pack more than just like a little water bottle. Mm -hmm. I tell everyone I go, you need to pack. If you're in the desert, they recommend up to a gallon of water a day uh, to drink. So I would be packing two to three liters when you do these hikes, just for your safety. That's a really great, really great advice. Um, cool. Any, anything else you feel like um, is relevant? Do you guys have a favorite trail snack? Mm, I mean, I'm a jerky and mango kind of person. Yeah, mango, banana chips. Yeah. Oh, banana <laughs> chips are my favorite. <laughs> banana <laughs> chips, yeah. jelly sandwich, you can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. I oh, always get electrolytes too, just in case we yeah. get stranded or something. Yeah. It's good to have electrolytes. I mm -hmm. will say the town outside of Zion is one of my absolute favorite it's national amazing. towns. Yeah. It's adorable. There are so many great places to eat. So I would 100% plan on at least eating out one time just so you can try one of the restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, Bryce does not have as exciting of a place <laughs> outside, but it does have a really cool bike trail. So you can ride your bikes all over Bryce Canyon um, and enjoy that. Yeah, that's a good call out as well. If you kind of want to, um, instead of like driving and, and stretch your legs a little bit and kind of enjoy sort of the viewpoints via bike is also a really fun way. Um, bike in the morning, hike in the afternoon or vice versa. Um, okay, awesome. Thank you guys so much. So we're just going to do a quick little uh, plug here about Zion and Bryce with Adventure Tripper. Um, so we do run um, a trip to, to these two places, which is like the perfect combination. Um, and so when you book with Adventure Tripper, you have a fully personalized itinerary that's based on your skill level and preferences. So all of these things that we kind of just went through about different difficulty levels, or if you have kids and so forth, like we will customize it based on um, whatever is sort of the right fit for you. Um, and we have some really exciting upcoming fall dates in September. Um, and then we also have a really fun group trip um, that's coming up. We have two spots remaining on it. It's September 13th to 15th. So if you want to come, um, if you're sort of like by yourself or with another friend um, and you guys want to link up with some other like really great um, people who are interested in adventuring, it's a really great way to sort of like build community and so forth. Um, so go ahead and, and check that one out. Or if you have any questions about any of this, you can always email us at team at Adventure Tripper. Um, and we also take care of your accommodations based on your on your budget. So you don't have to stress about, about finding any. Um, so for some of these like upcoming fall, which is a great time to go, um, it's perfect where you don't really have to stress about, about figuring out all of these details. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions? I haven't taken a look um, at the chat, so I will do that. Um, but now, now's your chance. I had one question. Yeah. Uh, I, I was wondering if you have shared your pictures from the recent trips, from especially from Brian. Bryce, not Simon, Brian, sorry. Bryce Canyon. Any I haven't photos? been there. I have read about it a lot. I have heard about it a lot. I, I will be going there sometime in the near future. So just curious if Sydney or Elizabeth has shared your recent photographs from the trip. Yeah, um, so I am gonna go ahead and this is a great plug for Elizabeth. I'm gonna go pull up her Instagram. <laughs> Um, so she has a blog, um, which you guys should also check out, um, where she shares all sorts of tips like this. Um, so this is her here in Zion um, at Angel's Landing, which is great. Um, and then she lives in Oregon, so we have some Oregon's back on. Here's Wall Street, which she had all to herself, which was that magical moment she was talking about. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, is there any others that you want to like call out on here that you feel like? Yeah, I cool? I'm trying to think if I, I don't remember what I've posted. I post so often. Um, I will say. Oh, is that the Horseshoe Bend? Yes, yeah. this one is Horseshoe Bend, which Horseshoe is Bend. nearby, which we, this is what we were talking about in the beginning where it's a really beautiful and really cool viewpoint um, that if you also want to kind of spend some more time 
in that area with slot canyons and all that worth it but otherwise maybe not worth the two-hour drive yeah it's beautiful I've been with the like pay system and one without um so it just kind of depends um if you is this one on the fairyland or Navajo that's actually Garden? Queen's Garden Queen's so Garden. Queen's Garden is like a really short little trail up and this is it ends at like this little viewpoint and this is part of the Queen's Garden area awesome gorgeous it's beautiful, right? Um, that's actually the Mossy Cave. Yeah, I was gonna say that's Mossy Cave. It, it's a man-made waterfall. And then there's a cave that you can go look at. Um, and a lot of people in the summer months when it's really hot, just walk straight up the river if they have water shoes and it keeps you cool. Kids play in it. Um, and it's really not very crowded. I don't know why people don't really go down there as much as they do the other areas. The first time I went, we almost had it to ourselves. And then this last time there was more people, but it was not bad. Yeah, I definitely think it's kind of the perfect, like if you like, like you're mentioning, if you go like first thing, Navajo, Queens Gardens, like really get that hike early, then the perfect way to kind of spend the afternoon is to go hang out. I feel like at, at like this like little oasis, which I feel like is kind of more of a hidden gem of price and that mo not as nearly as many people talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. We always go in the afternoon and cool off a little bit. Yeah. I don't um, think I cool. it, and then but... what's, what slot canyon is this? Is this antelope? No, that's actually in Grand Staircase. So okay. BLM land. Well, yeah. Awesome. Um, cool. Yeah, those were some fun photos right there. Um, Thanks for getting those. Yeah, Thank of course. Um, OK, I see a question here. Do you have any recommendations on how to find best camping options near Bryce? Elizabeth, I'm going to hand this one to you as the camping expert. <laughs> so my. I'm gonna have to pull it up, it's on my blog. My absolute favorite place that we have camped and we, so we camped the first time my husband just decided to splurge and get a teepee. And it was one That's of my fun. absolute favorite things that we've ever done. I think it was like $10 more than a campsite to sleep in this teepee. Um, and then when I went back recently in June with my mom, we were driving by and we just looked at each other and we're like, let's get a teepee again. Cause we loved it so much. Um, and so let me look it up really fast, but if it's worth it, it's such a cool experience to just sleep in these teepees and they have a ton of them. It is called. Well, while you look that up, I will say Ruby's for any, in. oh, Ruby's go ahead, in. sorry. Sorry, Ruby's in an RV park and they have like a dozen teepees that you can rent, um, but they also have a campground. So if you just want to camp and put your tent up, do it. It's um, a good spot but that's the only place I've stayed because we love it so much we just love staying in their teepees yeah I would say I guess Elizabeth let me tell me if you agree with this because it's been a while since I've been there but I feel like there are more um, camping options that are really close to Bryce where okay. Zion is much trickier yeah yeah and Zion's really hard to get into so we months out tried to get a camp spot in Zion National Park and couldn't get one so we ended up just in Springdale it's cool I mean it's Springdale it's right outside the park um, so we were able to part or to camp just outside in the town but we could not get one in the park mm -hmm. and then when we went to Bryce we never tried to go in the park just because we found those teepees online and we're like done like that's amazing I want to sleep in the yeah. teepee um, yeah um I know from my experience so for anyone who doesn't know what dispersed camping is that's actually kind of my what I do the, the most often when I go camping which means that you're camping for free on BLM land um or just public lands but there's no established site like there's no picnic table there's no fire pit um any of that sort of things and so you have to have like all of your own water with you and all you have to be really self-sufficient um but there is a great dispersed like there's dispersed camping literally like two feet from Bryce Canyon um and so it makes it super easy it's like a two minute commute <laughs> in the morning um and it's literally like the road like right like in the left um before you like hop into the park um so freecampsites.net is really helpful um Zion is much harder to find camping um I feel like in in experience um but both are are so great um Awesome. And then the last question is how far in advance um, did you schedule the shuttle? And so the you're unable to schedule the shuttle within Zion, um, but it runs like really quickly. Um, but the problem is just like if it fills up, you have to wait for the next one. Um, so you just want to sort of get to essentially like get to the first shuttle stop as as early in the morning as you are willing and able. <laughs> um, it's a, if you're not a morning person, Zion can be a little bit more um, challenging. You just have to know that you're going to wait a little bit longer for that shuttle. There's also a shuttle at Bryce. 
and a lot of people oh, will take it. That's a great call out. Um, how often does that shuttle run? I don't know. No. I've never taken it just because we've always been there first thing in the morning. So we have no trouble parking. And a lot of people just take it because the parking lots are small. And so it can get hard to like park at the viewpoints. Um, so I think it just depends what time you get to the park. If you're getting there early, you should be able to get parking easy. Um, and I cool. mean, people are always leaving. So you, you'll get a spot eventually, but I yeah. don't know. When they go there. That's a great, no, that's a great tip though. I, I, I always think of Zion as like the shuttle, um, but sometimes you forget at other national parks that that is a great way to like avoid any sort of parking issues. Cause it is always a bummer when you get someplace, especially if you've done something in the morning and then you go to an afternoon spot and the parking lot is full. Um, it can be kind of disappointing and you get us kind of like wait a little bit. Um, so yeah, the shuttle on Bryce is a great option. Awesome. Um, great. I don't see any other questions. Did I miss anything else? Um, anybody? Cool. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap this up. Thank you so much to everyone um, for hopping on. And obviously, thank you so much to Elizabeth and Cindy. It was so great chatting with you guys about, about your experiences here. This was really fun. Um, and then for anyone who um, is on as well, I'm going to be sending out an email tomorrow that has sort of the deck. Um, so you guys can have that as well as um, the recording for today if you want to reference it back at any point. Um, all right. Um, so with that, we're, we're going to go ahead and sign off. Um, thank you, everybody, and, and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye -bye.